So I'm glad to introduce uh, Professor Ryan Martin, who is um, at North Carolina State University, and he's uh, one now of the main of the top researchers who's working on uh, statistical inference using uh, belief functions, actually. And uh, I think he will give us a, a nice talk or, about his work and maybe how it's positioned with respect to other approaches to statistical inference. Okay, so I give the floor to, to Professor Ryan Martin. Okay, well, great. Yeah, thanks, uh, Terry, for the uh, introduction and also the folks for the invitation to uh, uh, participate and uh, also for the folks who are there um, to, to, to hear the presentations, everything. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, of course, very disappointed I wasn't able to make it uh, to Japan would have been a, I think a great opportunity, but uh, you know, sometimes these like a uh, zoom or WebEx meetings are, you know, it's kind of tedious. We have so many of these things now, but 1 thing nice is the technology means that can participate in these kind of things, even if we're not able to be there uh, in person. So I think it's a, a well, I guess let's, let's we'll get, get on into it. So, um. I like to um, start out some of these presentations to talk about or like to highlight some uh, remarks made by other folks who I guess have maybe more authority in the uh, area than I do. Um, so these are a couple quotes from maybe three names, at least two names I imagine you know, um, uh, Jimmy Savage, uh, Don Frazier, and uh, uh, Brad Efron. Um, so these are all, um, all three of these things are kind of uh, touching on the same basic point, which is that um, you know, there's probability and how this is related to statistics and effectively we, we don't really know how this works. And so uh, here are, I guess, a few uh, perspectives on this. One is uh, Savage talking about, uh, you know, complete disagreement and breakdown of communication. Um, uh, Frazier is talking about, uh, you know, uh, two methodologies, two logics that can uh, frequently give substantially different answers to the same problem. Uh, and then Brad Efron saying here that, well, unlike most philosophical arguments, you know, uh, this one has some practical consequences talking about the, uh, how they represent sort of competing visions on how science progresses and so forth. So, uh, the point of this is just to say, well, okay, well, while there's uh, lots of work on statistical inference and how probability is, is, uh, used in there, um, we still don't really know how this works. And so I think that this creates some opportunities for, um, maybe folks in this community and other communities thinking about, uh, uncertainty uncertainty quantification more broadly, um, opportunities to have some contributions here to maybe, maybe hopefully to resolve some of these problems. So, uh, like I said, the, we've not really settled these really fundamental questions. And so, um, you know, I think that this is really a shortcoming of uh, what statisticians have been able to do over the last uh, 100 years. Um, if you kind of look into things now, I mean, we're, we're, we're not very good at, uh, um, Maybe even even being honest about the kinds of things that we <laughs> uh, that we can do well and that we can't do well, and so uh, this I think is a good example is that I just showed you those three uh, quotes from uh, leading experts on the previous page that were basically saying that um, these differences are I mean there are disagreements and there's differences and we don't know how to settle this, uh, and then here is very recently a, a, a statement coming from the. American Statistical Association president uh, talking about, um, I mean, this is a task force, not the president himself, but uh, says, well, different measures of uncertainty can complement one another and no details were given, no other, like, uh, I mean, no, no examples, no guidance. Um, and so this, this really kind of is uh, kind of counter to what was on the previous page, right? That those were saying, well, there's an issue that needs to get settled. And this one's saying, well, in fact, there's differences, but that may, maybe these are even uh, good things because they complement one another. Um, so there, there's, I think this lack of answers is, is uh, uh, creating confusion and some kind of distrust. So example of this is like in the replication crisis. And so, um, you know, it's it's something that I think we need to to try to sort out. I mean, not having answers, I think is, is okay. Um, but the trouble that I see is that there's sort of lar largely no motivation to find the answers. And I think this is uh, some, you know, creates some kind of complacency. And so to me, this is just too important to ignore. And this is a uh, Frazier again at the bottom saying, uh, is complacency in the face of this uh, contradiction acceptable for a uh, central discipline of science? I would say no. Um, and so I think that's that kind of leads into uh, um, where I'm where I'm going with my work. And that is, um, you know, we need some new insights. And so 
we're we're not sort of starting totally from scratch, right? Because there's giant set of shoulders we can stand on. So if a few of these guys are, are uh, names you're, you're of course familiar with, um, Ronald Fisher, Art Dempster, Glenn Schaefer, and Didier Dubois, and of course there's many others, and I just uh, picked a couple of those here. Um, so if I didn't list your name, then I'm, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to to just uh, touch on a couple of those things. So my basic claim is that. Well, the probability theory that we're relying on is is lacking in a certain way. And so in order to do reliable inference, reliable and certainly quantification, this is the different considerations. And so these different considerations land roughly under the umbrella of, of imprecise probability. That's that's my view. Um, so what this means is that the imprecision uh, that is uh, folks talk about in imprecise probability theory uh, for statistical inference, for reliable statistical inference, this is actually necessary. It's not something that we can decide, well, I want to be precise or not. It's uh, actually necessary. And I'll, I'll tell you something about that here shortly. Um, so what I'm putting forward today, and I guess what I'll, I'll present here is at least some kind of highlights of, of, of this, uh, uh, I guess, fairly broad picture. But uh, uh, what this is going to do is it's a general kind of imprecise probabilistic framework for statistics. Uh, this is going to be using uh, consonant belief functions, like I mentioned in the in the title. Um, I'll maybe refer to these from time to time as uh, like possibility distributions, possibility theory. Um, but anyways, it's uh, using this kind of special structure in in belief functions. Um, and so what this is aiming to do is to achieve some kind of balance between what the Bayesians, the reliability Bayesians want, and what the and the reliability that frequentists want. Um, and so this is a I hope to be able to communicate this today is that uh, this can actually do things that neither the Bayesians nor the frequentists can do. All right, so uh, what I want to do in sort of roughly in the, the kind of outline here is to say, like, why do we need this imprecision? So I made that claim before that the imprecision is something that we can't avoid. Um, and so I'm going to talk about here a, a sense in which trying to force precision into our inferences uh, is uh, pushing the likelihood too far, and what that ultimately does is create this this uh, unreliability. Okay? And so then I'll try to argue that the kind of uh, uh, imprecision that's kind of right for these problems is the ones that has this consonant belief structure. Uh, and so then what I want to do then is kind of tell you, okay, here is how I uh, am proposing to achieve this kind of possibilistic uh, inference uh, using this thing called a probability possibility transform. Uh, so then we'll talk about some properties of this thing and a number of examples. Uh, and then I have, it's a relatively small section in the entire presentation, but uh, it's this part at the end about the incorporation of some partial prior information that I'm actually quite excited about. And uh, I think this is where we'll get to see some of the things that uh, this framework can do that the, neither Bayesians nor frequentists can do. Okay, so I wanted to start with a warm up. Uh, part of it is is uh, uh, just to make sure that we have some kind of like a um, notation terminology in common so that we can uh, follow one another. Um, so let's start with this uh, relatively simple kind of textbook example. So I'm teaching the undergraduate probability class this semester, uh, and this is definitely one of the ones that comes up is this uh, kind of problem about uh, 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 cancer screening. Uh, it doesn't have to be cancer, obviously, but some you know some kind of disease. Uh, and so the the setup goes like this: is that you're told that uh, a patient comes and takes this uh, uh, cancer screening test, uh, and then they test positive. So the data we have is that the patient tested positive. Uh, the hypothesis that we're going to be interested in is the hypothesis that the patient has cancer. Okay, so. Um, if they test positive, they may or may not have it. It has something to do with the, the reliability of the, the testing uh, mechanism. Um, so the testing mechanism is described by this, this model. Um, and so this is just giving a couple conditional probabilities. One is probability of uh, uh, testing positive given you have cancer, that's 0.95. Probability of testing positive given you don't have cancer, that's uh, 0.05. I, I made up these numbers, but this is uh, typical for these kind of examples. Uh, then we may also have some other information. This one just says this is probability that the patient has cancer is 0.01. And let, let's let's say that that's some information that's available at least uh, at the moment. Okay. So then the question here is: so suppose the patients had a positive test, do they have cancer or not? Okay. And so what makes this a kind of an interesting example is that this is where we see what Fraser was talking about about it's possible for these uh, different methods to produce different answers. And so what happens in this case is that a Bayesian analysis will say. Uh, I think the patient doesn't have cancer, whereas the non-Bayesian answer or non-Bayesian solution will say, I, I think the patient does have cancer. Okay. So obviously these are significantly different conclusions, so uh, try to get to the bottom of this. Um, so I'll just show you a few formulas here. This is how you r arrive at those two solutions, the non-Bayesian and the Bayesian solution. 
Uh, up top is the non-Bayesian one. Um, there's a few ways that you can do it. I mean, in some sense, it's there's really no way you could come to a, a different conclusion if you're just using the, the data itself. But uh, one way to look at this is just with the likelihood ratio. Um, and so you look at the likelihood ratio for the same data based on the two hypotheses, cancer or not. Uh, this is a huge likelihood ratio. So you'd be uh, really no other option but to infer that the, the patient has cancer. Uh, you could also calculate a p-value for this. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter really about the formula, but uh, this will also lead to the same conclusion that you can't uh, reject the hypothesis of cancer. Okay. The Bayesian solution goes uh, quite a bit different. Um, so this is a familiar formula, how you go from the like a prior beliefs to posterior beliefs. Uh, think of the U here as like that prior information. This maps from the prior to the posterior here. Uh, I have a plot of that function uh, in terms of the prior information that's being uh, uh, fed in. Um, so what you see, of course, is it starts out at zero and then increases pretty quick. So over most of the range of the prior information, the, it sort of would indicate a large uh, posterior probability for cancer. But if it turns out that there's a, it's having cancer is rare, uh, then this can end up being a small number. And so in, in the particular example I was mentioning here, it was a 1% chance of, of cancer a priori. So this turns out to be a relatively small number, 0.16 um, based on this. All right, and so 0.16 is small, so then the Bayesian would infer um, not cancer. Right? Sorry, the posterior probability of cancer given test positive is small, so the inference would be that they don't have cancer. Okay, so what's the, I guess, sort of the takeaway here? And so I, I like this um, um, uh, sort of statement. It's basically common sense at the top here from uh, Mansky, but it's nice to sometimes to see the common sense just written out here explicitly. So uh, this says that credibility of inference decreases with strength of assumptions. Um, and so if we look at a couple things going on here, right? So if we genuinely know that uh, uh, prior probability of cancer, then it seems like that shouldn't be ignored. And if you can't ignore that and you actually genuine, genuinely, genuinely know it, um, ought to include that into the analysis. And so the Bayesian solution uh, uh, perhaps makes sense. Okay. If we don't know that uh, prior information, then maybe there's other cases where we really have no idea what kind of uh, um, prior information is available. Of course, it would be silly to just say, well, let's pick 0.05 or 0.5, uh, and then claim that the analysis is, ob is objective. This is something that happens sometimes in, in statistics, and I think that's uh, uh, really not, that's certainly not following what uh, Mansky suggests here. Um, maybe it's better to report the whole range of the posterior probabilities as the prior uh, information varies. And so that's what I meant here kind of by this plot, is that here you can see, well, depending on what I'm willing to assume, I get very different or potentially very different um, uh, conclusions about cancer or not, right? And so if you really don't know prior information, maybe that's the better way to, to uh, present the results. But here you see that if you, uh, if you present the results this way and then you say, well, I really don't know, probably need to report the whole range from which goes from zero to one. So you're uh, upper bound on the, on the posterior probability for testing, sorry, for, for having cancer given a positive test would be equal to one. And then the, now the, the disagreement between the Bayesian and the non-Bayesian goes away. Okay. But actually, there's this most likely case uh, in the sense that right, in, in real problems, we probably do know something, but not enough maybe to justify like precise knowledge about the, the, the prior information. Right? So maybe something we get would be we could quantify in some way like uh, we're pretty sure that this uh, uh, posterior pro or prior probability of cancer is between, you know, uh, let's say, 0.01 and 0.05, right? Maybe we know something like this. And so then what would, what would we do uh, in a case like this? This is, seems like would be quite common in, in practice, uh, but then the textbooks about statistics say really nothing about this. And so uh, I think this is a place where thinking about things using imprecise probabilities and belief functions and so forth, uh, this can actually add some value to um, uh, what we're currently doing in, in statistics practice. All right, so let's get into some, I guess, more, uh, um, into some more some more details here. So um, let's say I have I'm just setting up notation here. So the the the, the data I have is some y. Uh, that's the uppercase y. I'm going to observe something, and I'll just denote the ob observed value of that data by small y. Uh, there will be a model that's uh, uh, incorporated here. So this is a meant to. Th so this is just means the distribution of y for a specified value of this parameter, and then this parameter ranges over some parameter space uh, bold t. Okay, so uh, this is just a collection of distributions for y indexed by some parameter. 
Okay, and so when we set up the problem this way, what we have in mind is that there's some value of that parameter that I don't know, it's uncertain. Uh, and so I'm gonna write that uncertain value as big theta, uppercase theta. Uh, and then the generic ones I'll just call, uh, like lowercase theta will just represent generic ones. So here, this is just the generic one is ranging over the whole set of uh, 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 parameter values. Okay, so for the moment, let me just uh, assume that we don't know any, uh, don't have any prior information available about this uh, theta. Um, so then the goal is to uh, quantify uncertainty or to make inference about this theta given the observed value of Y. Okay, so just as a quick kind of example, make sure that we're on the same page. This just says, so suppose the model we have is a, a normal distribution, uh, mean is uh, this, this unknown theta, okay? And then we observe something. And so let's say the something that we observed is a, a value Y equals seven. Uh, then I might be interested in some kind of hypotheses about this this uh, uncertain uh, parameter value, maybe like that the that that mean value is greater than eight. And so what I would like to do is to use the information in the data to decide whether I think this hypothesis hypothesis is supported or not. Right. That's the uh, the roughly the goal I have in mind for this uh, uh, when I talk about uncertainty quantification and inference. Okay. So you've. If you've looked at uh, statistics textbooks before, you see probably what they do is they say, well, for inference, we do either estimation, testing, or confidence intervals. Um, that actually is not what inference means, or at least that's that's my view. Uh, and part of it is that you know if, if you um, imagine a scientist who's never seen a, tech, a stat textbook, uh, they're unlikely to go and find a consultant and then ask them for a confidence interval. The kind of things that they would ask would be, can you assign maybe probabilities to these hypotheses being true, right? That's the sort of natural way that scientists think about uh, inference. And so we've, as statisticians, I think we've just convinced the scientists that they can't ask those questions, that they have to ask questions about confidence intervals or hypothesis tests. Um, so I think that we should try to get away from this uh, procedural way of thinking and, and something more, uh, maybe some kind of uncertainty quantification that's maybe more informative, uh, uh, richer in some sense. Okay, but that doesn't really help us to know what to do. Um, and so uh, even uh, philosopher uh, Ian Hacking says, well, you know, statisticians want uh, numerical measures of degree to which uh, data support hypotheses. Okay, so when he's when you see something like this numerical measures of, at least for us in, in statistics community, we immediately think about probability. So you know, the gut reaction would be that Hacking is saying, well, we should just come up with some kind of a posterior distribution for this theta uh, given observed Y. So one of one way, for for example, might be uh, Bayesian, uh, but there maybe would be other ways to approach this. Okay, but now, so if, if our gut reaction is to think about probability, remember the claim I made before is that something maybe is going wrong with the the use of probability for this this purpose, and so that's what I want to talk about next. Um, so I, I mentioned at the beginning about this. Uh, um, uh, I mentioned briefly about the pushing the likelihood too far. Okay, so I, I should make sure that it's clear this uh, likelihood function. What I mean by this is it's like that uh, the model I started with has some density function. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of that density function at the fixed observation as a function of the parameter. Right, so it's just kind of switching the role of variable and parameter in this case. So this is essentially the data plus the model produces this likelihood and the likelihood is a function of data for, for given y. So one of the things that we're we're good at, uh, I guess we we communicate this in in our like stat courses, is that likelihood function is not a probability, and the reason is that you it was a probability in y for a given theta, and so when you switch the roles, then of course that breaks the probabilistic structure. So there's a quote there at the top of from uh, uh, Fisher, um, and so there, there he's saying that uh, this function of the theta is he means the likelihood function there. Um, this is not a probability and does not obey the laws of probability. Uh, he mentioned there specifically it, it ha involves no differential element. So that's the point I wanted to uh, uh, highlight here. Um, so when he says there no differential element, uh, what this means is that if we're assessing a particular hypothesis about this parameter, uh, that the size of that uh, um, hypothesis has no bearing on the inferences. Okay, so whether the hypothesis is big in a like a measure theoretic sense or small should have nothing to do with uh, whether the data can support it or not. Right, so it's only these relative likelihood values on the hypothesis that are relevant to inference. That's that's what Fisher's uh, saying when he talks about this differential element. Okay, but now if we think about what do we often do, right? So what we often do is, at least in this uh, 
default prior type of bays or um, fiducial things, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, what these things will do is they effectively take the likelihood to be a driver of a, um, a probability distribution. Okay, and so in this default prior bays, what is often done is you treat the you take the likelihood and you multiply it by some other kind of measure um, that itself doesn't have any meaning. It's supposed to be somehow like a, a, a like non-informative about the the, the parameter. Okay, so this non-informative thing has no meaningful dif differential element, and if the likelihood function has no meaningful dif differential element, how could you get a meaningful differential element when you multiply them together, All right? So that that just like it can't happen. Um, so here is just a quick example to sort of see uh, the consequence of this: is that uh, so? If, Imagine a very simple situation like we talked about before. I have a normal observation, and what I observe is seven. Um, so then, under the, really any kind of these uh, default style uh, frameworks, uh, the, the 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 posterior distribution that would be produced would be normal distribution centered at seven. Right. So it would just a very simple kind of thing. Um, so now, if, imagine I have two hypotheses. Uh, well, this one is goes six point five to seven. This one goes from minus infinity to seven. Right. So obviously the the h is a subset of the h prime. Um, so for sure we shouldn't assign smaller uh, support to the uh, larger hypotheses. But what actually happens in this case is that the this like geometrically larger hypothesis h prime gets a lot more uh, support from data than uh, h. Okay. So then the question is, I mean, can the data really support h prime more, like strictly more than h? Okay. And so this is where we get into some some kind of trouble is that the 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 data is a, apparently supporting this h prime a lot more than h but in fact it 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 can't because remember fisher said there's no differential element that can uh, make the the size of the set be of, of any relevance okay so what are the consequences of this uh, pushing the likelihood too far so i just i mean this was just some observation about okay there's some uh, uh, kind of relations between the the when we plug in different hypotheses, but what are the consequences of this? Um, so uh, the situation I have, just a sort of brief description of this is saying, so imagine that you have some kind of hypothesis that turns out to be false, right? So it's one where that that H set doesn't contain this uh, um, true value of the parameter. So then you can think of the posterior probability assigned to that hypothesis as a random variable, a function of the data, right? And so, it would be problematic, that's what I'm arguing here, is that if this random variable tends to be large, so under the this distribution, when the hypothesis happens to be false, right? So if I have, if I'm assigning large uh, uh, support to that hypothesis, then I'm likely to infer that it's true. But if it happens to be false, then I'm making an error, right? So this this kind of disagreement between the like probabilistic behavior of the posterior distribution Posterior probabilities as a function of data and the truth of the uh, of the hypotheses. So this disagreement can lead to some errors, and so that it would be problematic if we were making these these kind of errors. Um, so then there's this uh, notion of false confidence uh, we defined in some paper a few years back, uh, talking about uh, this is a particular type of unreliability that all probability uh, all probabilistic uncertainty quantification suffers from. Okay, so here's what the statement says, and then I'll try to explain this in in some. Um, um, easier to, to digest sort of terms. Uh, but this just says, take any data dependent probability distribution on the parameter space, okay? Um, so however you get that, maybe through one of these Bayesian procedures, something like that, then whatever thresholds I wanna take, this row and tau, their numbers between zero one, I can always find at least one uh, hypothesis such that the hypothesis is false, and yet the posterior probability that's assigned to that false hypothesis is large with, or, I mean, relatively large with some relatively large probability, okay? So this is talking about this uh, problematic case up here, and it's just saying that you can always find a hypothesis for which this uh, problematic uh, uh, case happens, okay? So let, let me try to put this into some maybe more like English or like uh, sentences versus like the symbols. So this is, I, I haven't written anything about this, at least not yet, but this is something I've been thinking about recently. So another way you can kind of think about this uh, false confidence theorem from the previous page is that there would be, like there exist gambles such that you, if, if you produce that Q of Y as your uncertain quantification, that you would judge those gambles as acceptable in the sense of not having some kind of like a negative expected loss. 
uh, but they turn out to actually be unacceptable on average over the data. Okay? So this is unacceptable means it's uh, prone to loss. So like your, your, your expected winnings would actually be negative, but you thought that they would be positive. So that's, you end up with this, this kind of disagreement. Uh, I don't wanna get into the symbols of this here, but what we're talking about is that um, there's a risk of losing money, right? And so that, that uh, I think that helps as a different way of interpreting this false confidence theorem is to think of it, not in terms of this like errors, but in the sense that this can cost money. Um, if you, at least if you imagine this kind of a, a maybe hypothetical type of a gambling situation. Okay, so I'm gonna I want to skip the symbols, but uh, let me show you. Let me just mention this uh, last bullet here uh, because I think this communicates better what's going on than what the actual symbols about this how this argument goes. So um, if you were thinking about ordinary probability theory, so uh, if you were ever to make some judgment like this that expected value of some random variable given uh, value of y is non-negative for every y, then there's no way that the like the expected value of Z, the unconditional one could be negative, right? Because you're, you'd, the way we understand how probability works is that you'd be averaging these things which are non-negative and the average can't go outside of the range. So it would have to also be non-negative. What's happening here is that there's a disagreement between our assessments of these different probabilities. And so this uh, uh, loss prone uh, feature that I'm describing here means that this type of uh, intuition about how probability works is broken. Right? And so that's what's causing the potential uh, uh, for loss here. And this is all coming from this uh, uh, false confidence, confidence phenomenon. Okay, so what I've just pointed out is, okay, in this, uh, uh, that this false confidence theorem says um, any data dependent probability, right? So this isn't something like, well, we could just pick a different prior distribution and then this goes away or we could switch from Bayesian to fiducial and it goes away. Um, it doesn't go away because you can, no matter what this probability distribution is, you can always find these problematic uh, hypotheses. So the only way to escape it would be to go imprecise, right? That this was about describing our uncertainty for given data in terms of probabilities. And if all of those have some flaw, then we have to go to something else, what I'm gonna call here this, the imprecision, okay? so. I mentioned about Fisher and how this, some of the things were related to him. Um, in fact, if you dig into some of the stuff that he wrote, uh, I think that he knew something about this need for imprecision, but just didn't have like the, 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 um, like the math wasn't available to him at the time. And so I think that um, he wasn't able to capture these things, but in the words that he wrote, you could often see this. And so here's just a couple lines that I'm uh, abbreviating, but uh, talking about things like, does not justify any exact probability statements. Uh, there's no exact probability statements that can be based on confidence intervals. Uh, so when he's talking about no exact probability statements, he must be saying that there's some kind of probability statements that are just inexact. Right? And that somehow must have something to do with imprecision. Um, but so despite that maybe Fisher didn't, wasn't able to sort of connect these dots, uh, I think that uh, other folks building on the work of Fisher, um, one of the name that of course everyone here knows is uh, Art Dempster. Um, and so his efforts at the very beginning to develop the, the belief function theory were all based on trying to extend Fisher's ideas in this uh, um, context of statistical inference. And so those efforts led to some of the origins of imprecise probability and uh, belief function theory and later the stuff that Schaefer did. And that's uh, much of what goes on in this, uh, um, you know, talking about in, in, this, in this conference. Um, Jersey Neyman is a, a name that maybe is less familiar to folks here, uh, more familiar to statisticians actually. Um, so Neyman develops, or I guess his interpretation of some of Fisher's ideas led to this notion of confidence intervals. Um, and I, I'll say something about this a little bit later, but the, uh, this frequentist theory of inference, confidence intervals in particular, these have, uh, uh, there, there's some inherent imprecision in these. And so I would argue that in, even what Neyman did, which had nothing apparently to do with imprecise probability or belief functions actually does have something to do with those things. I'll, I'll say a bit about that uh, here later. Okay, so if what we're doing is not probability, then as I mentioned, it needs to be something uh, something else. Um, I, I I guess this this would be something I would probably say more to the statisticians, but I guess it's it's uh, it's maybe worth to say here too is that uh, when we talk about imprecision, we're not saying uh, that things are imprecise or sorry that they're inaccurate or that they're um, um, 
poor in some sense, right? It's not supposed to have some negative connotation to it. Uh, and the reason is that the where this imprecision comes from is that we're consciously limiting our precision to be credible, right? That's what Mansky was was suggesting. Um, and so then I maybe don't need to say so much about this, but uh, uh, for when we're dealing with imprecise probabilities, uh, belief functions in particular, uh, one way you can think of this is just as reasoning with sets of probabilities. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to skip over this because uh, you guys know all about these things. But if I talk to statisticians about this, I need to kind of explain this a bit more. Um, one thing that I do want to mention, and and you know, it's not obvious that the the statistical inference problem would have imprecision in it, right? And so. Um, I like to show this one because this is not just about me saying that things are imprecise. It's that you can actually understand this through math. Um, uh, so the claim here is that you know whether we realize it or not, uh, statisticians we have uh, joint distributions for data parameter, right? And we're dealing with sets of these things. So the explanation goes like this. So if if what we wanted to do, let's say we have a, 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 a this is called a set estimator, but that you could think of this as just, I'm gonna produce an interval that's trying to hit the unknown value of parameter. It's like a confidence interval, okay? And so if I wanted to find what is the, like if, if this, this was, was a stat theory class, we might say, well, calculate the confidence level of this particular uh, set estimator. That calculation would be this thing that's on the left where you would look at what's the probability that this set contains the thing you're trying to estimate and then you so you find the probability or I, I, this is that it doesn't contain um, then you you calculate the probability that it doesn't contain that uh, the true value that you're trying to estimate and then you maximize over all of the all of the parameter values okay so the the confidence level is just a number is has nothing to do with the parameter all right so th that left thing on the left hand side is equal to this thing on the right hand side more complicated uh, but what you see happening here is that this is just um, I'm introducing some kind of prior distributions for the parameter. This is an average of those uh, non-coverage probabilities over here, but then you maximize over all of the priors, right? And and this by means strictly all of the priors, uh, every every distribution that's supported on the the parameter space, okay? And so the reason why this is inequality is because the thing on the right hand side is a linear functional of the Q. And then we're maximizing over this linear functional, and the space is a convex set, so the the supremum would have to be on the boundary, and the boundary corresponds to point masses, so that's what makes these things line up. That this is a maximum over the points, this is a maximum over all the the, the convex combinations of points. Uh, the maximum occurs on the boundary, um, so that's that's why there's, this is an equality, right? So even if we are strict frequentist statisticians that say, I, I don't have any joint distribution, I just have a, a model indexed by parameters. In fact, they do. It's just hidden behind the scenes. In, and so for us to think in terms of imprecise probabilities and, and uh, sets of joint distributions is not out of the question because, it, I mean, it's mathematically justified. Okay, so if we're if we accept that, okay, we're actually dealing with these kinds of uh, uh, sets of joint distributions, then the, the fact that we would need imprecision for this is is uh, perfectly clear now, because uh, how could we go from complete imprecision or ex ex extensive imprecision down to something that's precise? Uh, that's just a way, would be way too much to expect. So what I'm going to propose here is that uh, the imprecision is going to come into the analysis by me deciding to acknowledge it. And so that's just me writing down a data dependent imprecise probability, which will be used for uncertainty quantification about this, uh, the unknown. Um, and so then this just look, this is the thing, this uh, inferential model is just a way of writing down these, uh, or it's just a procedure by which we construct these lower and upper probabilities, the imprecise probabilities. So it goes like this is that. You give me data and information about the model, maybe some other things. Um, then to every hypothesis that I might consider about this, the, the unknown, I'll just attach a couple of numbers. And so this would be a, a lower probability and an upper probability um, uh, attached to that hypothesis that depends on the unknown, or sorry, depends on the, the, the observed value of data. Okay, so this is just producing uh, data dependent measures of support and plausibility for hypothesis, right? So you could think of this support as a belief Right? And so that this could be like a belief and plausibility function pair for the um, um, for the the unknown parameter. Okay? All right. So now there's of course tons of these uh, kinds of there there be tons of ways to construct this inferential model. This uh, we know all of these different kinds of impre imprecise probability theories like belief functions, uh, these uh, consonant beliefs, the uh, plausibility measures. Um, 
credo sets, lower upper provisions, many, many things. And so these, of course, all of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, what I'm going to focus on uh, in this presentation is this uh, consonant belief functions or possibility measures. Uh, I'll have some more to say a bit later about like specifically why I think that this consonant structure is the is kind of the quote right way to do this. Uh, but let me just for now, uh, kind of, I'll defer this to a little bit later, but let me quote uh, from uh, uh, Schaefer uh, talking about here that there are specific items that you can treat as uh, evidences you can treat as, as consonant, uh, but there's one general type where this makes sense. And so he's talking here about inferential evidence where evidence for a cause that's provided by effect. Um, so that's exactly the context that I'm thinking of here in, in statistical inference. And so um, at least according to Schaefer, this is it's not out of the question to focus on consonant structures. Um, so another advantage of this actually is that uh, possibility theory and the consonant structure makes things relatively simple. So of, of the imprecise probability theories out there, this is uh, at least arguably the simplest one. Um, and so if, if I, I know at least one presentation is maybe tomorrow about possibility theory specifically, but uh, so if students are there, if, if you have uh, um, not familiar with the possible possibility theory and the consonant structure in belief functions, uh, there's a number of places to look, but uh, I mean, the, Didier Dubois has uh, written extensively about these things. I don't know, a thousand papers or something. Uh, uh, so there's lots of information out there, and I'm I'm just going to touch on the, like the just the very surface of, of of these kind of ideas here. So what I like about this, and the way I like to explain it at least, is that it's uh, similar to or analogous to probability theory. Um, so it goes like this: is that there's a sort of a density function. I'm using sort of quotes around this density function because it's it's similar in spirit, but it's not uh, this, the same kind of form. Um, so all that happens now is that instead of in probability theory, we do integration of, of a density function. In possibility theory, what you do is you optimize this analogous density function. Okay? And so one thing to notice here is that with this optimization step, there's no differential element, right? That thing that Fisher was kind of saying, okay, well, that's uh, something sort of a sticking point um, that when we insert this uh, differential element, which doesn't belong, that's the thing that creates this false confidence phenomenon. And so this, this formulation has no differential element. So of course it, we have no reason to expect that it's gonna run into the same false confidence issue. Okay. So more specifically, here's how this goes, is that there's this thing I'm gonna call a contour function. Uh, and this is just a function of parameter to uh, uh, interval zero one that depends on the, the observed value of, of data. Uh, the one constraint is that, well, it can't be negative, it can't be greater than one, but it also has to um, basically attain the value one. Right? Um, and so then here's how this works, is that you take this, this uh, contour function, and then again, it's, instead of integrating it to attach probabilities, what you do is you optimize to attach a possibility. Right? So we optimize this contour function over the hypothesis that gives me my upper probability, my possibility uh, um, measure for that uh, uh, hypothesis. And then we use the usual kind of like duality between the lower and upper uh, to define the, 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 the lower probability or the necessity um, attached to this hypothesis. Okay, so now, again, I'm just, these are just uh, ways of defining things uh, that doesn't determine specifically what it is we want to do in, in, in practice. Okay, so I, I need to say something a little bit later here about like, so what would make a particular uh, choice of this inferential model uh, good or its output meaningful is the properties that the thing satisfies. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that, but let, let me show you um, just a picture so you get some kind of idea what's going on. So this is a plot of just uh, some kind of generic um, uh, contour. Um, and so this, you see it has this, it's, between zero one uh, goes up and it down and down, but it does uh, here hit that um, that value one. So this is one of those contour uh, functions. So now imagine I have a hypothesis interval three to five. Okay. So now how do I calculate this uh, the the upper probability, the possibility attached to this hypothesis? Well, I just maximize the function over the interval, right? And so of course we see it's decreasing here. So the uh, uh, the maximum is attained at the edge. Right, so there's the the would be the possibility attached to this hypothesis. Okay, so what it's doing is just picking out in this hypothesis the one that's the most possible as the highest uh, contour. And again, there's no differential element. So what you can see here is that if I were to stretch this interval out, say from three to twenty, right, I get exactly the same possibility value attached to it because it doesn't matter about the size, right? And that's the no differential element type of uh, um, structure. 
Okay. And so there's a couple of other things that you could imagine maybe doing here is that, well, if you actually just wanted to find an estimate of this parameter, right, just one number that says, here's what I think the parameter is, you could find that point where it's maximized that where it's the value one. Um, so in this case, it's roughly around two, but th that doesn't mean anything for us now. Um, another thing that you can do would be to draw some cut, say it's uh, level 0 0.05. That's where this uh, dash line is. And then you say, okay, well, what are all those parameter values that have a contour that exceed this cutoff 0 0.05, right? So that defines here in this case, an interval, maybe a little bit more than one to maybe a little bit less than five. Right, and so that would be something uh, I'll show you here in a second. That's what it is, but this would be something like a confidence interval for the um, um, for that unknown parameter. Okay, so there's lots of things that we can do with this, you know, point estimation uh, confidence intervals. If we wanted to perform tests, we could use this uh, the the possibility value here. But the point is that we can do lots of things with this uh, um, with this contour uh, that largely are, are related to something like the, that. I like to call possible. Uh, uh, Sorry, um, possibilistic reasoning. It's that I can compute possibilities for any kind of hypothesis and use this to make judgments about uh, uh, judgments and then ultimately inferences about the the unknown parameter. Okay, so this 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 sort of general thing I'm describing is is not new. This is not my idea. Um, it's a, actually quite natural to think about possibility theory in in statistics, and and it's been done uh, a number of times. So. Um, one way that this has been uh, uh, proposed, uh, one one approach to this that's been proposed was even in, in Shaper's book, uh, talks about defining this thing called the relative likelihood, which just means take the likelihood divide by the maximum, right? So once you define divide by the maximum, you've you've uh, constrained the function to zero one, and then the point at which this one hits one, right? It has to be the point where this denominator is the largest, right? So um, this would have those properties of one of those contour functions, so. One way to approach this is just okay. So I'm just going to define my contour function to be the relative likelihood. Right? It's the y is fixed and the theta is varying, and then you can compute the possibility, the upper and lower probabilities, just doing the optimization things like before. Okay, so this is uh, something that's been looked at by a number of folks besides uh, uh, Schaefer. So uh, Wasserman and uh, a while back had a nice paper about this, and uh, uh, Terry is here um, as. I actually heard the speaker earlier this morning talk about the same paper. Um, so uh, this is a paper in IJR 2014 about uh, um, um, using these uh, likelihood functions, likelihood ratios to construct uh, uh, possibility distributions. So and probably others. I, I'm not, I don't claim that's an exhaustive list. Uh, it, not long after Shaper's book, he kind of revisited this and actually said, uh, rejected the idea. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I'm so convinced by his uh, uh, reasons for rejecting the idea, but uh, uh, I think there's some other reasons why there's like a little bit more that needs to be done to it to turn it into a thing that I think is at least right for uh, uh, my purposes with with statistical inference. So I'll talk about that here shortly. Okay. So what am I actually suggesting to do? So that's the I guess the next thing I wanted to talk about here. Um, what I'm suggesting to do is. Um, it, well, it's the thing I'm going to describe here on the screen. This is, uh, I guess, driven by something, this uh, probability or imprecise probability to possibility transform. Uh, this is something that uh, Didier Dubois and, and, and others have written about. Uh, I actually first encountered this uh, working when I was on uh, um, uh, Dominic Hose's uh, PhD thesis committee. Uh, this was just a couple years back. Uh, so I, I noticed this in some of the work that he was describing, and I thought, well, that actually looks quite powerful. Uh, and then I started reading some more about it, and that, that's actually how I uh, ended up coming to <laughs> thinking about some of these things. Um, so in, in the case when we have no prior information like we're focusing on here, uh, at least for now, um, this probability to possibility transform takes a pretty simple form. Um, so what's going to happen is we use the same relative likelihood from before um, and then just do an extra step to it. Okay, so instead of just using the relative likelihood itself, I'm going to transform it through this uh, uh, operation on the right. All right, so it maybe looks a little bit weird because, well, there's a bunch of R's and Y's and, and thetas, but um, so what th what's happening here is like this, is that this R, Y, theta, that is a random variable, right? Because this uppercase Y is like a, a, the, the random variable part. So this is a random variable. This is a fixed value. So it's like the Y and theta are set out here on the outside. So this is just a number. This is a random variable. We're just calculating the CDF of that random variable with this 
at this particular uh, uh, value. Okay, so this and then well then this this defines a possibility contour. So we can then talk about the upper and lower probabilities associated with it, just doing the usual optimization. Okay, so the 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 thing that I'm in this displayed equation actually is familiar. Uh, I mean. I don't know about the, the experience of folks uh, here in the audience, uh, but for, for stat students and, and statisticians more generally, uh, this is something that is familiar, at least more or less is familiar, uh, is this would be known as a type of a p-value, right? So this is the kind of things that we do when we formulate hypothesis tests in like the stat textbooks. Often we do this using p-values and the way to define a p-value is you have some kind of a quote test statistic and then you check you know, you need to find like probabilities in the tails of the distribution of that test statistic. So that that is exactly what this calculation is 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 doing here. So it's maybe not surprising that this is going to have some properties that we're we're familiar with that p values have. And so I'll say something about that in a second. Uh, I do want to remind you that this is uh, actually just a one special case of something more general. So even though this one looks familiar, it doesn't mean that that that's uh, that there's nothing new here. So I'll I'll get to that here shortly. Uh, but I do want to say that there's, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this here shortly too, is this uh, uh, some connections to the fiducial inference, which I think is uh, uh, not expected. And so I, I was actually pretty excited about um, identifying these things. Okay, so a while back, I, I emphasized this thing about, uh, you know, what makes the inferential model output and the choice of its uh, particular form, what makes it meaningful or useful is the properties that it satisfies. Okay, so the kind of properties that we're interested in, uh, at least this is what I'm, I'm proposing, is that um, things related to like the errors, right? So remember the the um, talking about the false confidence theorem. This was about being prone to errors, right? And so what we're trying to do is we want our our statistical methods to be reliable. So let's try to control the the likelihood or the chance of of errors. Okay, so the what we're just saying here is that, well, we want to, uh, you know, if, if you imagine that these things are going to be used repeatedly, we want to avoid these systematically misleading conclusions. Okay, so here is at least a, a, I'm kind of summarizing some things here, but this is the basic result um, that says, well, that thing that I just defined before uh, has this property that I'm calling strong validity. And so strong validity in this context means the following, it means that um, I'm going to look at the contour function at the random variable y, that's the data, and at the on the true value of the parameter. And I want to know what's the probability that this ends up being small. And then I maximize this one over all of those uh, true uh, parameter values, and then I want this whole thing to be small. Okay. And so the, the rationale behind this is that if this number is small, right, then that means that if I, um, what am I saying? Okay, so so what what's going to happen is that th this will um, I'm sorry. I, okay, so if, if I was let me, let me say this. I have the next slide is probably easier to explain it. So this is a uh, I guess the most basic property, and while it's maybe difficult to see, this actually implies the that we don't suffer from the the false confidence. Okay, so let, let me put this into um, Maybe some context that's a little bit more familiar. Okay, so imagine that what we're going to do is we could perform some kind of like a statistical test. And so the test maybe would be like, okay, there's this hypothesis H, and I would then reject that hypothesis if the upper probability that's attached to, or the possibility that's attached to that hypothesis is small. Okay, so that's what the, the rule here says reject the hypothesis if this condition is satisfied. So then that test would, sat, would have this property. So this would be, Probability that we end up uh, rejecting the thing when rejecting that hypothesis when it was true, and that is controlled at this level alpha. So this is the usual like type one error that we talk about in like the stat textbooks. So this this uh, type one error control comes automatically from the the, the problem formulation. Uh, similarly, we can find these. Uh, uh, confidence regions. So what this would look like is you would define that set of all the parameter values where the contour exceeds some threshold and then that set of uh, parameter values would have that uh, coverage probability uh, uh, um, guarantee in the sense that the probability that you miss the thing you're trying to 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 hit um, is no bigger than the, the the target level alpha okay so this, this is the usual the type 1 error control and the the confidence properties for these uh, uh, confidence sets um, one thing to notice is that if you look at a different kind of set that only uses the relative likelihood 
So instead of processing it through that probability to possibility transform, uh, then this set, which is using this level alpha threshold, uh, actually doesn't meet this condition. Okay, so at least not in general. And so that that I think is one reason why it makes sense to do that extra processing because these. Uh, uh, possibility values, I think it's beneficial if they have a um, problem independent interpretation in the sense that like, I don't have to know about the, the particular distribution that's being assumed in this model. I don't need to know those things to judge what it means for uh, um, the possibility values to be large or small. Okay, so having this kind of basic uh, um, uh, scale on which we interpret these things that has nothing to do with the problem, uh, I think that's that's of some some value. And so that's that's one thing I think that's that would be missing from just working directly with the relative likelihood. Um, so I, I, I showed you here about how you can do this. You construct the inferential model, how I described before, and then it has these properties. Uh, so there's a sort of a converse of this, and it's a it's a little bit of a stretch to kind of like put all these details together. So I'm not going to attempt to um, um, say this like very carefully here, but um, I do think this is interesting because this is part of what suggests that that uh, um, consonant structure is really inherent to the the frequentist paradigm. Um, and so what this one says, I'll just kind of skim this, is that if you give me a set of confidence regions, so a family of confidence regions indexed by this uh, uh, confidence level. And so it, this can be produced through any procedure. However, you can construct these things. It could be Bayesian, could be something else. As long as it has uh, these properties, so one of the properties is that it has to actually be a confidence region. So that's this uh, uh, coverage probability type guarantee. Uh, it also, in this for this theorem at least, it needs to be uh, nested sets so that like, um, that your 90% confidence interval is uh, contained in your 90, 95%. Okay? So this is a very natural type of uh, uh, condition. And then there's one other thing, which is actually quite mild, but it's too messy to write down. So there's a few conditions here about this uh, family of confidence regions. Uh, what the theorem says is that you can actually find a one of these strongly valid, like possibilistic or consonant uh, inferential models who's going to produce its own uh, kind of a confidence set, like through this this uh, construction here, and that that's actually going to be contained in or equal to the one that you started with. Okay, so this means that. Um, so th this means that whatever you start with, you can always do at least as good by just formulating one of these consonant uh, inferential models. So it's a kind of a converse to this, is in the sense that anything that would satisfy this coverage condition would lead to or would correspond to one of these consonant IMs um, or, a constant, or, or a consonant IM would be better than that one. Okay? So this is, a, I mean, there's a, probably too much for me to try to explain here, so I'll just leave it at that. But the ultimate point here is that uh, this suggests that the consonant structure is actually uh, uh, closely tied to um, um, frequentism. Okay, so I have... One more thing here, which is about some kind of general properties, and then we'll get into some examples. I, I thought it was better just to kind of like lump all the properties together and then we can uh, shift gears. Um, so this one is a, a bit different, and this is, I guess, something relatively new that uh, um, worked out. Um, so if we jump back to this ordinary type one uh, error type property. So in, in this statement here, this one is saying that here's a property that's satisfied for any H. Okay. So you can think of this one as kind of like, uh, um, like in uh, analysis, you have things like pointwise properties. So this is pointwise in the hypothesis H. Uh, and then the difference here is that actually you could make this uniform in H in this specific sense. So what this means is that instead of having the for any H on the outside, I can move the H to the inside of the probability statement. Okay, so now that just maybe seems like a, a just a mathematical type of uh, uh, result, but this actually has some, uh, I think, practical consequences. And so if you think about when we're talking about inference, right, the scientist, like they have a scientific question that they're trying to address. And so uh, there's, I think some, it's concerning that, uh, that statisticians, I think, have kind of convinced the scientists that uh, the answering their scientific questions corresponds to testing a null hypothesis. 
Um, and so I, I think that, you know, the point is that inference is not just about write down some null hypothesis, test it, and then walk, walk away, right? The, the goal is actually to get to what kind of hypotheses are supported by the data, right? So just setting up one kind of like straw man, null hypothesis, testing it, rejecting and walking away, like that's not science, right? So I think that what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to say, okay, well, first I perform this kind of basic test of a null. Likely I'm going to reject it because that's just a, a like I said, kind of like a straw man type of a, a null hypothesis. Then the next step would be to try to find what kind of things are, support, what kind of hypotheses are supported, right? So that, that's like what I'm calling here this probing is that you then would, after you reject, then you want to ask follow up questions. Now, those follow up questions would indirectly depend on the data because you're only asking those things because you rejected the previous null. Right? So there is a, the, the, the hypotheses get tied to the data if you think about it in this probing sort of way. And so moving the hypothesis to the inside of this thing allows technically these H's can depend on data. Right, because this is saying it doesn't, I mean, it's inside the probability statement. So I'm allowed to let the H depend on data in some way. Right. And so this being able to move the H from the outside of the probability statement to the inside uh, has some practical consequences. So this is just to say that you do have some control on error, even when you're probing, uh, not just testing fixed, uh, um, fixed hypotheses. And it, yeah, this one, so by, I should mention, so my uh, former student, uh, and he's now an assistant professor in Wake Forest, uh, uh, Leo Cella. Uh, so he and I, this was a paper we did recently, and so this, I guess, is to appear probably soon in the IJAR. Okay, let, let me say something here about the computation. I, I forgot about the order of the slides. So. Uh, I, I showed you this uh, formula here, and I mean, it's a relatively simple formula in terms of the symbols, but it's maybe not at all obvious how you would compute this thing. Um, so in some cases you can do like uh, actually closed form expression, like you can find the closed form expressions. These are not gonna be the ones that are like the uh, practically interesting ones. Those are just kind of like the toy problems, uh, but there's nothing that says we can't use other kinds of uh, computational procedures for this. So like Monte Carlo is quite powerful, has, I mean, uh, Lots of applications, and this happens to be one of them. Uh, this is a very naive kind of crude way of doing it, but you could just you could produce that uh, uh, contour function by um, just a bunch of Monte Carlo samples. Uh, so this one just says, okay, you fix some value of theta on a grid, right? Then you go and you maybe generate a, a number of these observations from this the distribution with that value of theta there. And then now you have a bunch of these uh, observations from different parameter values, then you can just approximate that thing by uh, Monte Carlo. So this is just uh, uh, averaging these indicators. So it's just a probability calculation, uh, but this is approximating that uh, uh, um, distribution of the relative likelihood. Okay, so other uh, you can do some other things that are more sophisticated. Sometimes the problem can be done in a, a you know, problem specific type of way. Uh, important sampling is another tool that uh, seems to work that that way you can cut down on the number of uh, uh, theta points at which you do these uh, simulations. Uh, I think, uh, let, let me, okay, I, I should probably say this first and then we'll get to examples, sorry. Um, things that I've been talking about entirely so far are concerning this uh, like validity type of notion. So like this is concerned certain kinds of errors. And the kind of errors that I'm talking about are like where we have a hypothesis that's true, but I get it wrong and I set the upper probability to be small, right? Another one could be, well, maybe the true value of the parameter is outside of the, the, the confidence interval that I produced. So those are types of uh, errors and the validity properties that I described are about controlling those errors. Okay. The uh, um, other kinds of errors, and this, this relates to a notion of efficiency that I'll, I'll describe here in a second. So this is the kind of errors that, in, that are involved in the efficiency considerations are like when there's false hypotheses to which I don't assign a small uh, possibility or values of the parameter that are like wrong, but they're included in the, in the confidence set. All right, so these are also kind of errors. They're maybe lower uh, concern than, some, than the, the validity ones, but these are also of some concern. Okay, so what we would like to be able to do is to achieve some balance between the validity and the efficiency. So while validity is, we have a clear definition for this, uh, efficiency seems harder to define mathematically. 
Um, so what I wanted to do here was to kind of say roughly what I have in mind, because this, uh, I'll make some relevant comments uh, to this a bit later. Um, there's one case where I think it's sort of totally obvious what it would mean for efficiency. Uh, this isn't so practical, but I, I need to say this one anyways. So let's imagine that there are two inferential models that are in consideration. Um, maybe we can even say that both of them are valid. And so then we'd like to compare them, right? So we're interested in the properties that they satisfy. So how do we know which one of these is better? So if it happened that the one contour was everywhere less than or equal to the other, right? So what I mean here is this is a function of theta and a function of theta. If they're if the one is everywhere below the the other, right, then the one that's smaller is more efficient than the one that's larger. Right. The reason is that I prefer these things to be tighter, more informative, this would correspond to narrower confidence intervals, um, so forth, right? So this would be better. And so I prefer uh, uh, an inferential model whose contour is tighter than another one, okay? But now this is, it's too much to expect that if I have two reasonable inferential models that I would have this ordering, that like one would be always above the other. Okay, so what will typically happen is that they might have different peaks, maybe also different shapes, but like for a given data set, they would not line up and you wouldn't be able to directly compare them. So one would have a peak at one, the other one have a peak at, uh, say, at 0.5, right? So then you can't directly uh, compare them in this way. Okay, so what do I mean by efficiency? So the, the, in the type of thing that I'm shooting for is something like this, that uh, the contour function I say here tends to be more tightly concentrated uh, as a function of the data. Okay, so this tendency to be more concentrated is I'm finding this difficult to write down mathematically, but like the intuition I think is clear is that we want things to be sort of as tight as possible. Uh, but writing down some definition is a bit of a struggle. But uh, so anyways, what's going to happen is that I'm going to do a few things a bit later. Uh, I may not uh, explain these in 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 full detail, but. Uh, uh, the idea is to try to achieve this balance between the validity and efficiency. So that that'll come up uh, here a bit shortly. All right. So what I want to do with these examples is basically so you see some pictures and you can see that okay, when I uh, you you have data of this type from this kind of model, it produces a one of these uh, uh, contour functions, and then we can of course do the things that I mentioned before with that contour function. Um, I picked these examples largely so you could see some kind of diversity in the the, the shape of the contours um, so that they're not all the same looking picture. Um, so here's a couple that we can start with where you can see some similar structure, but uh, they're actually very different because of the the, uh, the parameter space. So these are two uh, uh, two models that involve some uniform distribution. And so it goes like this is the one. The first one is uniform on integers uh, one, two up to theta. Um, so that means that my observations are going to be values, their integer values, one, two, up to theta, but I don't know the theta. Okay, so what in this case, so what I measure is the the maximum in the sample is ten, um, and so that's that turns out to be enough to uh, um, to determine the the the. the any kind of like estimators or anything like this. Um, so then what's happening here is that this is a plot of the corresponding contour uh, under this situation based on the construction that I showed you. And so the spikes here are like, because the, the parameter is not on a continuum, it's only on the integers. So you get the possibility at 10, at 11, at 12, 13, like this. And of course it's decreasing, but it's not a probability mass function like maybe you would expect by immediately looking at this picture because of course it's value one here. So the sum has to be greater than one. Uh, the one on the right is a little bit more complicated of a problem, but I guess a similar kind of thing is that it's a uniform distribution on some range and I don't know what the range is. Uh, so I wanna use the data to infer that. And so what's gonna happen here is, uh, well, this is ultimately what that uh, contour looks like. Again, using the same construction that I described before, uh, we have a same kind of shape, it's this decreasing type form, but now it's continuous. Uh, so here is a, another example with binomial data. Um, again, what's shown here is the contour plot. Don't pay attention to the red and the green uh, uh, for now. Um, so the black line is the one that's produced based on the procedure that I described earlier. Um, and so then we, we can see from here is that if I wanted to calculate like uh, what's the, the um, if I had a hypothesis that was like 0.6 to 1, right, I would maximize the contour function over that interval and that would give me my uh, um, um, upper probability, which I can uh, use maybe to make some inference. 
Uh, as you go from the picture on the left to picture on the right, what's happened is the sample size has increased. So as well, as we would expect is that if you got more data, it's more informative. I should get a tighter uh, kind of contour. And so what you can see is that's that's what's happening here. Uh, it does have these weird spikes on it, but that's just a consequence of the discreteness and the binomial distribution. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, a, another example, one involving, a, I guess, a fairly specialized kind of case, but this turns out to be sort of a challenging problem is that uh, data is a bivariate normal, meaning like I have a, a mean vector and a covariance matrix, but in this case, the mean vector is known and equal to zero, and the covariance matrix is partially known. I know that it's a one on the diagonal, but on the off diagonal is an unknown correlation. Um, so it, it's not important why this is a bit tricky, but uh, uh, so what I wanted to do here was just to show you that actually, like, aside from the kind of uh, um, uh, ability to attach these lower upper probabilities and like the the possibilistic type of reasoning, uh, this actually works well, at least in terms of like the usual sort of statistical type of uh, metrics. Um, so what I'm doing here is just looking at uh, coverage probabilities of those confidence intervals. Uh, this is for the method that I just described to you. And then this uh, R star, that's a, a name for uh, a kind of strategy that's um, it's large sample motivated, but it's they work very hard to get like, a, um, it's called higher order accuracy. Um, so th this is supposed to be a, a, a a high quality procedure, this R star. Uh, so this this in this particular problem, we're we're trying to hit a 95% uh, coverage. And so what you see in like the the inferential model form, inferential model case, all of these are within this uh, tolerance of uh, um, 0.95. Uh, when the sample size is kind of large, the R star falls a bit short. Um, so that's I guess some indication that the the using some kind of asymptotic approximation maybe still isn't, you know, even a very good one, um, falls a bit short in terms of the, the, the usual kind of metrics, whereas the inferential model is able to um, um, address that. Uh, okay, so I, I showed you these are all uh, one-dimensional problems. Uh, these are not uh, um, really high dimensional, but uh, you, these things can be done in more than uh, one dimension. So it's mostly just so I can show pictures, I'll focus on a couple of uh, um, um, two dimensional cases. So this would be like a normal distribution where you don't know the mean or the variance. Um, and so this is what one of those contour plots would look like. It's like a, a coming out of the screen at you. So it's like a mountain kind of coming out. Um, so similar for say a gamma distribution that has these different parameters. Uh, now it's not the shape obviously is different, and so it's uh, I guess again you can kind of see some diversity in the uh, the form that these things take. Um, there, okay. So what I did here, I showed you one parameter cases, a couple of two parameter cases. There's situations where you might have multiple parameters, but you're only interested in some feature. So these are usually called uh, marginal inference problems. Um, so this is one of those cases where actually the data comes from a, um, um, well, you have two binomials and this corresponds to like a clinical trial where you have uh, treatment and control. And what you're interested to know is, is there some association between the treatment and control? And um, so a way to measure this association is with an odds ratio or a log odds ratio. Um, and so then to make judgments about association, it's effectively inference about this uh, log odds ratio. Uh, that is a feature of the two, two parameter model, uh, a one dimensional feature of a two parameter model. And so then this requires some marginalization. Um, so this is quite a bit more difficult than the previous ones, although at the, at the end, I'm able to just produce a picture, which is kind of similar to the ones you saw uh, previously. Um, this is one more example, kind of looking at the performance of the, the, the solution that I'm proposing here. So um, again, there's some nuisance parameters that we have to marginalize out, but this is actually a classical problem is the, what's called Barron's Fisher problem. This is where I'm interested in the difference of normal means when the variances are completely unknown. Um, so there really is no solution to this problem. There's actually, well, there's lots of solutions. Uh, none of them are, quote, the solution. Um, so it's in some ways still an unsolved problem. Um, so what I've done here is just uh, uh, showing the results of a simulation to check kind of how does the thing I'm proposing compare to some of these other more standard methods um, in this problem. Uh, I picked here just one example for illustration. It's a particularly problematic one because of the uh, extreme imbalance in like the sample, uh, yeah, sample sizes. 
Um, so what we're looking for here is like 90% coverage from these methods. And so uh, some of these are actually quite poor, um, like the one that just assumes things are, uh, um, it's like the most naive kind of thing. Just think of it as approximate everything as normal. Um, this does quite poorly. Uh, other things are more conservative. The only one that's really on target uh, is the the solution that I'm proposing here. So I, I don't know. I mean, this needs to, some more investigation, but uh, um, I guess this might be the quote best of the, the available solutions. I'm not sure about that yet. Um, okay, so I, I've talked here about um, mostly these relatively simple parametric problems, and that's that's just for the so that I have a number of things I can show you kind of like a rapid fire. Um, so you get to see that, okay, this thing can work in these problems and it has good properties and so forth, uh, but there's no reason why it's restricted to those kind of cases. And so uh, here's just a couple papers also with my former student, uh, uh, Leo. Uh, one is about um, supervised learning uh, in this kind of context. And so there we uh, make some connections to conform prediction, if that's something that you have some um, um, Ex previous exposure to uh, this other one is about inference in cases that's like common in, in uh, uh, machine learning where you're interested in like um, the minimizers of some kind of like a risk function. Um, and so in this case, we rely on some kind of bootstrap approximation. So a lot of these things that you encounter in other places, like machine learning type of uh, settings can be incorporated into the, the procedure that I'm describing here. Um, it, it requires more explanation. So I'm, I'm going to skip over that. But uh, if you're interested in those things, uh, there's a few references and I can obviously um, um, share some other things if, if you like. Let me check about my time here okay uh, so i guess I'm, I'm a little bit behind where i wanted to be so I, I think i'll skip some stuff here so um the i wanted to say a few things about this connection the unexpected connection between the inferential model solution that i'm i'm proposing here and and fiducial inference i think this is probably fine to skip because you maybe don't have much experience with the uh, fiducial solution so making a connection to something you don't know probably isn't that uh, ben beneficial uh, but anyways, I, this was something I was actually pretty excited about because uh, um, I mean, fiducial was kind of the origins for a lot of the things and actually a large motivation of my own uh, when I first got started in this area. Um, so to be able to connect what I'm doing now to stuff that was my original motivation, I think was uh, was was exciting. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this. Just it's a bit uh, um, maybe a bit too specialized. Um, something that I've been looking at like very recently, like this is like within a, less than a month, maybe been thinking about this, but it, I often, I want to talk about the things that are on my mind. So I decided to put a, a little bit in here about this um, is about causal inference. Uh, so in, in causal inference, what you're interested in, in trying to assess is whether a treatment actually causes a change in the outcome. The outcome maybe is like uh, blood pressure of a patient, right? So you want to know, is it the medication that was given that actually caused the change in blood pressure and not some other kind of factors. So this is challenging because you you need to somehow have control on the other factors or uh, you know because then you don't know how to ascribe any effect that you see to the treatment versus some of these other factors. Um, so I, I yeah I think I'm I'm also probably running too short on time so I think um, probably need to skip most of this but I think what I wanted to emphasize here is that there is a um, standard way, at least in this quote, standard way that uh, folks, at least in, in statistics, are primarily thinking about these problems. Um, and there's some difference, I think, between the way uh, computer scientists think about these things and the way the statisticians are thinking about things. Uh, both of them have some, uh, I think, significant followings and the leaders of these groups are, are, are well known and, and, you know, authorities. Um, so I, but I have some trouble with the, the procedure that the statisticians are, are using. And so I, I think that there's some kind of a gap here. And so what, what I would like to be able to say, I guess what I'll say here is that there's a, a way that Jersey Naiman had originally proposed this uh, to do this. And this has been picked up by some others and, and extended, you know, significantly extended. Um, I, I feel like there's, it's, uh, um, like there's like corners being cut in some sense. And so uh, there's a, another way of thinking about this also goes back to Fisher uh, that I think is actually more in line with the way I would understand causation. Um, so I, yeah, I'd hope to be able to say a bit more about this, but I think I, I should skip it. But uh, the idea is that actually there's 
I believe that there's a way that this can be built into the framework that I was describing uh, to uh, here and actually can produce these same kind of imprecise probabilistic uh, solutions to these problems. And so um, obviously these don't mean anything to you because I haven't really explained the, the, the details here, but um, there are ways to produce a this like kind of possibility contour for that causal effect. Um, this is in a case where there's no covariates, but a more interesting one would be where I can actually relate the causal effect to some kind of like a, um, uh, what do they call these like uh, explanatory variables? Okay. And so in cases like this, it, I think what's actually beneficial is you could get directly to assessing the causal effect on an individual patient. Um, so there's some kind of individualized sort of notions here. And I, yeah, I apologize. I don't have time to, to, to say a bit more about this, but uh, maybe we can follow up at the, at the end if that's of, of some interest. Uh, one thing I specifically want to talk about because uh, so there's a few, uh, uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions that uh, I get uh, often from Terry. So I wanted to uh, 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 say some things about this here. So a couple of things, one is about why do I take the consonant structures? Uh, and another one is about um, like, why aren't I using the full power of the DS calculus? So the things like the DS calculus that I haven't actually mentioned, I mean, they're, they're kind of in there, but I haven't really done this specifically is the things like the Dempster rule of combination. Um, and so let me, let me say a bit about these things. Okay. So the consonant beliefs, these are actually very special. They, they induce some kind of structure. And so the kind of structure they induce is this kind of thing where it says that if you get a lower probability, that's positive, then the upper has to be one. And similarly, if you get an upper, that's less than one, then the lower has to be zero. Okay. So a way that you can think of this is that really only one of them is, uh, non-trivial. Okay. And so then because of this, uh, Kind of non trivialities that are, are induced here, then you could say, okay, well, maybe this is actually too imprecise. Maybe you could do something uh, um, better. Okay. So, yeah, so I have a couple reasons uh, for this. So, one is that, um, okay, so if we take that strong validity property as something that we are interested in having, so the strong validity property is what allowed us to conclude things about like the coverage of the uh, um, um, the confidence sets that are derived. So I think that this is something that we would like to have, whether it's a, something we insist on is a different question. But so suppose that we're insisting on this um, um, strong validity property. Okay. So then if we, this pair of things, strong validity and efficiency, if this is our priorities, uh, then consonance is, is sort of a given, right? And so what the result here says is that if you start with one thing that's strongly valid, then you can always find one that's consonant and strongly valid, that's more efficient and more efficient in that, uh, actually very special way that I had described before. So this is actually for every Y you get this kind of bounds, All right? So this just means that if you take strong validity and efficiency as, uh, objectives we want to achieve, then consonance is, uh, uh there's no reason not to do, not to be consonant. Okay. Another side of this is that, uh, when I'm producing these lower and upper, they're not actually bounds on a true precise probability for that unknown. Okay. So when we talk about like, if, if you interpret the constraints that come from consonants as, uh, like two quote, too wide of bounds, um, then it's, you'd, you'd be, they'd be too wide with respect to something that you're trying to capture in the bounds. So you'd be thinking about, there must be a true one and having loose bounds is bad. Okay. But the claim here is that if you could make them tighter in the sense of having one end being non-trivial, then that actually doesn't uh, add any value. Uh, and so the reason it goes back to this, uh, Schaefer talks a lot about this uh, Cornell principle. Uh, and the Cornell principle says sort of roughly uh, only the small and large probability values are meaningful. And the reason is that it's the small and large values that tell you what are supposed to happen and not happen. And so this is what allows you to test whether a probability is meaningful in the real world is you check, did the thing that the theory said won't happen happen? If it did, then you know the theory that proposed those probabilities is wrong, right? So it's, it's through this kind of process. Uh, and so in the context that I'm talking about here, there's no will or won't happen because it's just about this we're inference on unknown. Uh, but what gives us sort of inferential power is only these large and small ones. Right, so I can only really make inference when a lower probability is large or an upper probability is small. Okay, so if if it, so it doesn't really add anything if I could have 
a let's say let's say the the latter case where the lower probability is small if i get or upper probability is small if i could have a lower probability that was non-zero that doesn't actually add anything because what really matters is the upper probability being small not that not the lower probability in that case okay so that's i guess would be my claim is that the 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 consonants form isn't really a constraint for the purposes that uh, we're going to use it for um i've i guess the second question was about the um not using the the Dempster's rule. Okay. Um, so I'm not, it's not that I'm not using Dempster's rule. I'm not really using any rule. And so what that means is that, for example, if I imagine I have a pair of observations, Y1, Y2, the thing that I'm calculating, what I proposed is not equal to take the thing that I'm proposing for Y1, take a thing that I'm proposing for Y2 and combine them using some rule. Okay. So I, I mean, I can appreciate that it'd be nice if this type of property uh, held, um, but what my priorities are, are the uh, typo, uh, validity and efficiency. Um, and so enforcing one of these kind of identities, like where this thing applied to the pair has to be an operation applied to the in individual ones, uh, that's actually a constraint. And so, of course, if you impose a constraint, then um, I can't be more efficient under the constraint than I would be without it. Okay, so it, it of course, I, I do have that option, and so there, I guess there'd be cases when maybe we would consider to do this, like in uh, you know, some problems, you maybe don't have access to the, the data set itself, right? You only get maybe the access to some summaries, uh, and in cases like this, you, you might need to use these kind of procedures, and so in, in those situations, I don't see any problem with it. Um, something that you might uh, consider would be one of these, like, consonants preserving rules. Uh, this is I know these symbols are maybe just kind of weird, but what this is just basically doing is like multiply the contours for Y1 and Y2, then you normalize this way and that gives you a new contour. Um, so I think that this is a very reasonable thing to do, that I, but I'm, I guess, as far as I know, there is no proof of like strong validity for this. I think in some cases you can see it numerically, but uh, uh, I'm not aware of a general proof that something like this um, would be valid. Um, I think that it might be, but I don't know the, uh, I, I haven't proved it myself and I haven't seen it uh, elsewhere. Uh, okay, let me see. Time here. So, I, okay, I think I got five ish minutes, maybe. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do here, I'd hope to have a little bit more time for this, but uh, um, I mentioned at the beginning that, okay, this case where we have no prior information is, of course, is uh, one I think that's practically relevant, but there's a whole bunch of other problems that are not covered by that, and I think that are not covered by anything that statisticians are really thinking about. Um, and so this actually goes back to that warm-up example. Remember, there was a possibility that, you know, we might, you know, there's like a, a prior probability of, of cancer, and so you could know that or you could assume that you don't know anything about it, but maybe you actually in reality would know a little bit about it, but not enough to formulate and justify a, a full Bayesian solution. Okay. So I like to think of this in terms of some kind of spectrum. So there's this frequentist corresponding to all the priors, which I, I explained that uh, kind of thing before. And then there's the usual Bayesian thing that has their one prior. And so many of the real world problems, I think, are in the middle of this spectrum, not at the endpoints. And so by understanding the spectrum and being able to do something with it, uh, I think that there's some, um, um, I think a lot of potential there. Okay. So this actually is, I think, quite important in, in high dimensional problems because uh, these are situations where uh, some kind of regularization is like uh, is is necessary. So regularization in the sense that um, high dimensions, there's kind of like not enough information in the data to really uh, reliably estimate parameters, and so you need some structure and you need to force the structure on the the estimators and and statistical procedures uh, for them to perform reasonably at all. Um, the frequentists and Bayesians, because they're on the extremes, it's a bit awkward the way they handle this. And so I, I would argue that um, some other way of of allowing this kind of thing to be more in the middle and incorporating the information in a slightly different way um, could actually lead to you know, better solutions than what we're what we currently have with the two uh, two extremes. Uh, okay, so. Uh, much of the stuff is the same as before. So that's, I think, what's nice about the, the proposal that I showed you before is that we can almost directly just extend it into this, this kind of case. Uh, there's too many details here and not enough time for me to go through, but this thing in red is just the new version of that uh, contour. Um, 
there's some uh, structural assumptions that I make in here, but that let's skip over that. Um, this contour in the middle is just to show K integral. So the other one I showed you was a show K integral too, but I didn't think that that uh, uh, explanation would be beneficial there. But ultimately, this is just a show K integral. There's uh, um, ways that you can compute this thing. Um, so it's a, a, now just a new tool that we can use for this more general case where we have some uh, uh, partial prior information. Uh, there's a corresponding strong validity theorem. I don't think I need to say much about this. Um, I think I'll skip this. So computation we can do uh, again. This is pretty naive, but it's a thing that can be done. Um, I for sure there's better things to do, and and I think that's a, a interesting open question. Um, let me see. Okay, so. I had a couple of examples that I wanted to show here. Uh, I think maybe it's, let me, let me just go back to that. Uh, the 1 that we talked about at the very beginning, the warm up. Um, so, this was remember the thing about cancer and you, you had a patient taken a cancer test. Uh, they test positive uh, and what we wanted to know was, does the patient actually have cancer or not? And so that that was the, the objective. Um, so then let's just say here what I'm given is instead of. What we assumed before from the Bayesian side was that we knew this was equal to 0.01. So how about uh, maybe a practically more re realistic case is that we have some bound. And so how about the bound in this case is that it's uh, less than 0.05. Um, so this can be incorporated into a, one of these partial prior contours. I didn't talk much about this, but uh, uh, this would be one way to quantify this uh, kind of vague information in terms of a possibility contour. Um, and so what I've shown in the bottom is like the numerical results for a case where the prior is vacuous, where you know nothing. Uh, and then on the right is where you have partial prior information. And that's this, uh, the, the thing that's there. So in the case with the no prior information, it's the, the data testing positive drives the whole thing. Okay. And so in this case, if you test negative, then you have to assume that the, infer that the, the patient doesn't have cancer. And similarly, if you test positive, then you have to infer that they have cancer. There's no other considerations to take. Uh, but with this partial prior information, things are now a little bit different. In this case, if you test negative, you still would infer that there's no cancer. Uh, the reason is that this does allow the no cancer to be uh, highly probable. Um, and so then this would still, uh, a negative test would, would be evidence of uh, uh, no cancer. Uh, but in this case, it's like in the Bayesian one is that even if you test positive, um, it, we'd still end up inferring that there's no cancer. And again, the reason is that uh, this kind of uh, regularization pulls things down and actually uh, makes it more likely that it's a, a false positive than that the patient actually has cancer. Okay, so anyways, the point is that it's the same analysis, just with different degrees of prior information, and you see the different kind of conclusions based on that prior information. Uh, okay, so I just a uh, quick recap. I apologize a little bit long. Um, yeah, okay, so the, the, I think Fisher had, I think the roughly the right ideas uh, was getting towards this imprecision and some of these uh, uh, consonant structures, but I think didn't quite make it. Um, but these things are, are, are necessary imperative, I think, for reliable and certainly quantification. So I, I, I talked about this sort of new way I'm doing things with uh, uh, involving some likelihood in the consonant structure and the ability to incorporate the, the partial prime information. Uh, along the way, I mentioned a few of these things, and let me just uh, uh, touch on a couple that are here is this um, in terms of like some methodological methodological questions, like what are efficient ways to do that uh, showcase integral computation? Uh, something I'm interested in is like the elicitation of this partial prior information. So that's, uh, I guess if I have no experience with this, but I can see how there's uh, would be some kind of challenges and like how do we actually take the things that we do know and incorporate it into some, you know, basically to quantify that uh, for inclusion in one of these analyses. Um, I think there's interesting questions about the inferential model thing like a proposed and the um, contraction dilation as it compares to like generalized Bayes and maybe also to like a Dempster's rule kind of things. Um, so there is some differences. And so I guess it'd be nice to understand this, these kind of things better. Um, and then in terms of the open, open applications, I'd hope to say some things about causal inference. That's something I'm looking at, but uh, um, 
I guess I would say in some sense, all the applications are open because it's this ability to incorporate this uh, uh, vague prior information that I think is something that's not really been done, at least for in, in statistics. And so I think really any kind of interesting application is one that can be uh, tackled with this. Uh, so I've been working on some papers here and most of the material I've presented is in one of these three papers. I mentioned a few of them, a uh, few other ones, uh, but uh, this is, I guess, largely where my stuff is uh, can be found now if you're interested in in, in uh, looking into this more. And then last is just one kind of advertisement. I um, back last fall, 2022, uh, I taught a, a, a course at uh, my university. Uh, it's like an advanced topics course for PhD students. And uh, so it's about imprecise probabilistic foundations of uh, statistics and data science. So at the website that's there, I have all the course materials, videos and stuff. So if, if uh, students or anybody else wants to check that out, you're welcome to, you can find the things there. Uh, and then if I'll have these slides and, and other things are posted on my uh, website that's there. And if you have questions for me or wanna you know, talk, collaborate something, please feel free to send some uh, email. I'd be happy to, to talk. Uh, okay, so I think, yeah, sorry, I think a little bit long, but uh, yeah, thanks for your attention.